Okay, we shall begin. Let's uh, begin by playing homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. With reverence for the Buddha words and attentiveness of mind, we will strive to know the Dharma thoroughly. With diligence and care so that we can attain what the Buddha attained, we will strive to practice the Dharma fully. We love in our hearts and because truth is the greatest gift, we will share the Dharma generously with others. Thank you. Okay, this is an introduction to Sister Sylvia. Uh, actually, she needs no further introduction. <laughs> uh, Sister Sylvia has dedicated herself to the study and practice of the Buddha's teaching since 1992. She holds a BA Honours in Buddhist Studies from the Buddhist and Pali University of Sri Lanka and was a lecturer with her Ahmad Mata. She also has a Master in International Public Policy from John Hawkins School of Advanced Studies. Since 2001, Sister Selva has been a regular speaker on Buddhist doctrines and their practical application at local and regional Buddhist organizations. In 2013, she published her first book, Between the Lines, an analytical appreciation of the Buddha's life. She's now working on another book titled Towards the Light, The Buddha Guides to Heavenly Rebirth. Thank you everyone, brothers and sisters of the Dhamma. Uh, this is a sutta chosen by BDMS. I, well, although I've read through, I have read through every sutta in the Nikaya, I actually forgot this one. I have forgotten this one. So the opportunity to go through it again was very meaningful. Very, very meaningful. I enjoy it tremendously. I hope you guys would also enjoy the talk. It's a short, it's a very short talk, not very long. Um, and because it's very short, I, I, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about what we can draw from the sutta beyond what is written in the sutta. Um, Maybe just a quick introduction into the, 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 the sutta. If you have gone through it, you would know that the sutta started as a conversation between a naked ascetic. When they use the word naked ascetic, he is or he was naked. And it is part of self-mortification type of practices. It was very common in the time of the Buddha for people to believe that the more they, they hurt themselves physically, the better are their chances of realizing Nibbana, their, their idea of Nibbana, liberation. And the fact that he was a naked ascetic must suggest that he was a very serious seeker. He was very, he was very earnest. Otherwise, why would you put your body through all kinds of pain? This guy was a very serious seeker, okay? So this naked ascetic Kasapa stopped the Buddha midway, you will see it in a while, and asked the Buddha questions on Dukkha. So he was a very serious seeker looking for his escape from Dukkha. And the conversation between the two men, although straightforward, if you go through, you'll see that it's not complex language, pretty straightforward, yet not easy to follow. And the reason is because most people, when they read this sutta, they will read it as is, without realizing that this sutta had to be understood in the context of the time, the Buddha's time. That, that world, the Buddha's world, was rich with philosophical debates. There were all kinds of teachers pontificating on all aspects of issues. Broadly, the kind of thing they would talk about broadly would be 
morality, necessary or not, for, for the good, for the welfare of an individual, for the good, the welfare and the happiness of an individual. Is, was morality critical? Hence the word tamma. And if it were not critical, uh, then what's the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? So these were some of the philosophical debates raging, okay? And Buddha took a position. Do you want to mute everybody? Buddha took a position which was I'm okay, right? You can hear me? Okay. Buddha took a position that was different from all the other teachers. See, most people, in, most of the teachers in his time were arguing along certain premise, which I will show you in a while. The Buddha took a position that was completely different, unique in his time, and more so, even till today, it is a unique position, okay? Later you'll know. Unique position even for today. Because the way he explained the mind is not something that an untrained person can logically imagine. So if you've not seen the world, if, if you have not seen the world that the Buddha was talking about, you can only imagine. But when we imagine, we will imagine within the context of what we know. Which means you cannot imagine his world, the world that the Buddha talked about. The reality, the reality world, that one, or, or the world of ultimate reality, that's the one that it's not possible to imagine. It's completely completely inconceivable. You cannot imagine it. You can only experience it when the conditions are right, but you cannot imagine it. That is why his position was unique because no one without the same conditions in the mind could have seen it. No one else. That's what made Buddha the first enlightened person in this sasana. Okay? Okay, this is the sutta proper. All the black words, the black lettering, uh, translation by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling Rajagaha. In Bambu Grove, you may have heard of it as Weluana, Squirrel Century. So this was the Buddha's first, first temple, monastery ground, first offering. This is a gift by the king of Rajagaha, uh, Bimbisara then. Huh? In the morning, the Buddha dressed up, took his bow and his robe. This is an extra robe. Uh, entered Rajagaha for arms, and there, naked, the naked ascetic saw him, got really excited, rushed up to the Buddha, exchanged greetings. You see how polite they all were? They, they, he was very anxious among you, but they had to like, how are you? Lu, lu pa bue, you know, that kind of very cordial words. Huh? Then he stood to the side, and he said to the Buddha, we would like to ask, Master Gautama, a certain point, if he would grant us the favor of answering your question. You see, my notes here said cosmopolitan Rajagaha. Rajagaha was a very rich place. In Buddha's time, Rajagaha, alongside uh, Pasenadi's Kosala kingdom, the two of them were the equal superpower of the day. And to avoid the battles, to avoid fighting, they married each other's, they, they basically had exchanged of sisters uh, as wives. 
each other's wives. So um, Rajagaha, because it was rich, one and two, this was a young king. At the time when the Buddha went there, Bimbi Sara was a young man. And the young king newly came to the throne. He was very open to ideas. He wasn't going to be uh, led by the nose by his religious advisors. So he welcomed all kinds of teachers. We call them shramanas. So you have the mainstream religion, which is called um, the Brahmana. You know, you've heard of this word, Brahmana. Brahmanas are the priestly caste. They advocated mainstream religion, which was based on the Vedas, scriptures, religious texts. Okay? Anyone who argued against the Vedas were called Shramanas. And Buddha was therefore one of many, many Shramana teachers. Okay? And in Rajagaha, they all congregated. Why would they congregate there? Because the land was rich. This is where you, when you are homeless and you are entirely dependent on donations, public funding, for your subsistence, you will go to a place like Rajagaha. Because there, you can maintain schools and you can lead a relatively comfortable life. And if you are able to attract the kings and the noblemen as the Buddha could, then your order will swell, the numbers will explode, and then you become the magnificent teacher Renowned. And because Rajagaha is also a trading room, so you will have people go congregating there when they do their trades, then they get to hear of whoever you are, and then they will go off back to their own land. That's when you also become famous elsewhere. In the old days, no social media, so it must depend on word of mouth. A, a central trading point, Raja, Rajagaha, was a critical place to establish yourself. Okay? Buddha, if you recall, when he went in search of the Dhamma, when he was a young ascetic looking for teachers, he went to Rajagaha. Because they were all there. All the teachers were there. Okay? So, I said ground zero for all the political, the religious, spiritual, philosophical tussles, because they were all there. They were all appealing to the same donation pool. That is why the fights get very intense. Okay, I don't go into history. There's a lot of stories to tell there. We will move on with the suttas. Okay. Now, Kasapa asked for permission to, to ask the Buddha a question. Buddha said, not the right time. We have entered among the houses, meaning the, the lay people are waiting for, were waiting for him. They are going to dana him, right? Because he's going for his arm round arms round, and the fact that, that, that uh, Buddha must have been very famous meant that people were waiting for him. And he had to, he had to do it because his timing was like that, he had to do that. Kastapa is not going to be denied. Ask him second time, ask him third time, and we all know, right? You ask the Buddha three times, he will answer you. So this is what, what happened. After the third time, the Buddha said, okay, then you ask. <laughs> Because Kasapa said, we do not wish to ask a lot. It's a small thing, some more question, it's a more question. Just one, just one. Then he said, okay, okay, you yeah, ask. Buddha was very sweet. Huh? Okay. Now comes the big thing. Kasapa asked the Buddha, is suffering created by oneself? Buddha said, no. Then is suffering created by another? Buddha said, no. Is suffering created both by oneself and by another? Buddha said, no. Okay. It goes on. But this part, we have to stop. And we need to explore the key question here. Because this is the theme that runs through the entire sutta. The theme, the, the theme of dukkha. 
Casper was clearly wise. Unlike the rest of us, we have to knock our head again and again on this notion of Dukkha. Kasapa knew Dukkha, so he didn't have a problem. He already knew of Dukkha. What he wanted to know was, why is it like that? The cause of Dukkha, that's what he wanted to know. Why is there Dukkha? Not that there is Dukkha. Why is there Dukkha? You see my first bullet point. I said, one way or another, wittingly or unwittingly, preemptively or not, we are fixing Dukkha, meaning we, all of us. Why did I make this point? If you look at your own mind, at any one time, just look at your mind at any one time. There is a part in you that goes, I should be doing something. I don't know what I should be doing. Or if there were a tactical mo a problem in front of you, your mind is fixated about solving a problem. But if there were no problem, if nothing is happening, your mind is fixated on planning for the future. Or exploring regrets about the past, thinking about how to improve things, how to make yourself happier. Now, it can be big issues, like do I marry this person or not? Those are the big issues in life. The, the kind of milestones that you recognize will seismically change your life. But there are also the small little thing, like should I eat this? Should I do that? Do I, do I do this or do I do that? This kind of small little gotcham chikak thing, right? This small little thing. If you think carefully, why is there this fixation about the small things or the big things? It's really because you are seeking for the, that illusionary or the elusive perfect, perfect time. Perfect point that there is something in us that always that is always seeking that perfect thing it sounds silly when I say it like that but instinctively we are always looking for something better and subconsciously the assumption of something better is happiness, perfect happiness. You think about it, it doesn't make sense. But subconsciously, we are driven that way. We are driven to find pleasure, no pain, happiness, gains. We, we constantly have this urge to be better than now. And it's very subconscious. Someone like Kasapa had already concluded that whatever he was experienced was painful. How do you fix this? That, that's the basis of his question. My second bullet point said, says, the typical effort is tactical and focused on symptoms, meaning when we try to fix something, it's fixing what's immediate, or if you're preemptively, you're imagining what the next point would be and you preemptive fix the thing. So for instance, we're gonna have this big event, just make sure that nothing goes wrong because if anything goes wrong, we will all be very upset and we want to avoid being upset. So let's fix all the problems before they start. Sorry, that's how the mind works, right? And you, you multiply this by everything, every point in your life. The more it matters, the more you are preemptive. And so your mind back gets very busy fixing imaginary problem in anticipation of perfection. So what is tactical is what you can see and you tackle. This event, this person, this issue, this comment. It's all very tactical. Strategy is you take one step back. 
you look at your life as a whole and you say, hang on, what's the common theme that runs through the entire life? We were talking about Dukkha. It is not just one point Dukkha. It's a life. It's an entire life. What are the big issues? The, the, the underlying issue that leads to a life of Dukkha. So he was looking at the life and the underlying driver of Dukkha. We are just fixing by the event, fixing by the day, fixing a person, an issue. As I said, one issue, one event, one person, even if it's many issue, many event, many people, you are still tactically handling a problem problem. So you think about it. Kids are born. You worry about the nannies. You worry about the helpers. Who's going to look after kids? Kids grow up. The school you worry. The results you worry. Kids grow up even more. Cannot find a job. Cannot find a wife. Produce even more. Dukkha. So we are very tactical in the way that we go through life. Stages by stages, so many issues, they all have the same problem. We can find a way out of this dukkha. Everyone will have the same problem. And when you're tackling something tactically, there's no way you can solve it. You're just fighting fire. Whereas Buddha was like, no, I'm not going to fight fire. I'm just going to look at the whole thing and I'll pour rain, drench everything out. So that was how he tackled it. This, the third point that I wanted to make is this. You look at Kasapa's query, right? Is it, is it caused by oneself? Is it caused by another? Is it caused by both people, both myself and others? What he's doing or what he was doing was looking for who is responsible? Who is responsible? The first cause, the assumption of the first cause is Someone is responsible. Someone caused something to happen. Okay? That's the idea of the first cause. Someone caused a fight. Someone caused the riot. Someone led to flood taming. Someone did something which led to the situation changing. That's man's instinct. So when we talk about first cause, it really reflects man's instinct. If you look at your own mind, you still have that instinct. We all have that instinct. We call it blaming another or blaming oneself. The blame, the blame uh, habit, right? The idea of the blame habit is someone is responsible. But why do you need to find someone responsible? Because if you can find that person responsible, the assumption is you can fix the problem. If someone is responsible for the missing classes, we find a guy, we solve our theft problem. So you look for individual in anticipation that whatever event has to be caused by someone assuming you assume control. When you talk about someone is responsible, you're assuming control, okay? Something important to remember. Then he said, okay, you tell me nobody is responsible. Not I, not you, I mean, not, not me, not another, neither of us, not, not meaning combine, combine two people responsible. Not, then no cause. Suffering arising fortuitously, created neither by oneself nor another. Buddha said no. Okay, no suffering? Is there no suffering? Buddha said no, there is suffering. Okay, then you don't know what. Is it that you don't know? So it's actually very logical. Kasapa must have spent a long time thinking. He was trying he, he was a serious seeker. So he said, you said no. Not you, not I, not both. 
then not accidental, then there's suffering. And then you don't know, is it? I know. It is not that I do not know and see. I know suffering. I see suffering. So, would the uh, Kasapa's assumption, which is very typical of men, very typical of men, someone, something has to be responsible, if not bad luck, accidental, no cause. Why, why, if you look at all, all of us, right, you look at all our mind, look at yourself, your own life, the people in your life, something happened, the assumption is someone is responsible. If no one is responsible, you assume it's bad luck. Flower pot drop. Piang. Is it the cat? Not the cat. The wind then. This is nature, right? No wind. <gasps> Ghost. <laughs> we, we must find someone or something responsible. Okay? Buddha's reply. And then this is the part that is complete completely unique. There is an explanation. I said, there is an explanation, but it's like nothing anyone had heard. Dependent origination to, to, to today, to date, to this to 2,500 years later, no one has come up with it. And you know what is really amazing the neurological science neurological science discover, discovery over the last 20 years is actually confirming that he was right so someone 2500 years ago without MRI machines no electrodes and all nothing of the, the instruments that we have today to measure brain waves, chemical active, uh, brain activities, chemical imbalances, and so on, was able to hit the nail on the head and say that we all act and we all suffer. Can't quite lay a blame, but not that there isn't one. Imagine that. Okay, so how does it work? So this guy, really quite fed up already. He repeated the whole thing. I ask you, is it con created by someone? You say no. By yourself, no. By both, no. So he's really quite fed up, right? Now, I want you to look at this. Huh? The word Buddha said, it is not that I do not know and see suffering. Buddha said, I know suffering. I see suffering. Okay? The significance of this statement is that in order for us to understand the Dhamma, you have to be awakened. Awakened to how Dukkha works. You have to be awakened to the Four Noble Truths, in other words or at least one, two, and three. The fourth, you will see when you know what you're, when you start to practice according to the teaching. But one, two, and three, you have to see for yourself, experience for yourself, an episode where dukkha arises because of craving, and when craving ceases, craving drops, dukkha ceases. One has to see for oneself, be a real-time eyewitness to the episode, an event. It has to be a personal experience. We, your, you can listen to an explanation of the Four Noble Truths until the cow comes home, go to work again the next day, comes home a second day, and still nothing, you cannot really appreciate the genius of the Buddha. You really have to witness the event for yourself. 
to realize that he was right all along and he was brilliant. Okay, so we go on to talk about this. So, Kasapa, now quite desperate, can you explain to me? Let the Blessed One teach me about Dukkha. Buddha said, Kasapa, if one thinks the one who acts is the same as the one who experiences the result, then one asserts with reference to one existing from the beginning. First cause exists from the beginning. Suffering is created by oneself. When one asserts thus, this amounts to eternalism. Now, this is where the debate of the schools, the philosophical arguments of the day matters. So the two big philosophical arguments of the day were eternalism and nihilism. In Pali, we say sasata wadda, uche the wadda. Okay? Sasata wadda, eternal. The teaching of eternalism. Uche the ka. Uche is to ka. So, the teaching of annihilation. The one, so we start with that one, eh, who acts will experience the consequences. What does this statement imply? The one who acts experiences the result. You control. There is control. I do something, I turn out something. I am the cause, I am the cause of my own dukkha. I am the cause of my own dukkha. You search your conscience, you search your mind. Isn't that a, an assumption? For many people, this is an assumption. Someone suffers, he's such a mean person, he's fault. He deserves it. So that's why in our mind, it is very easy for us to think about, think, to rejoice in the idea of justice. Basically, if someone has done something wrong, he is evil, he is responsible, he deserves whatever that comes after. Who asked him cannot control himself? So our mind kind of swing like this or, or kind of float like this. The point is, you first have to understand this first point. You, the one who acts, experience consequences. You do something, that when you do something, this action triggers a reaction, you will feel the effect, right? So when you say something like this, you are implying some kind of control. The room is too hot, go and change the temperature. So you change the temperature, the temperature changes, you experience the cool air. See that? The idea of a direct action, re uh, a cause and an action, an action and a re reaction, if you like. Consequence is direct, cause and effect. It's direct. If there is control, then it must follow that there is a self. Why? The idea here is if you can control, control, then there is something that is in charge. Something has to be in charge, then there's control. If nothing is in charge, where is the control? Who has the control? Okay, that's the idea here. So if there is control, it must follow there is a self. The, this is very, this, this is not an idea. This is an instinct. You look at your own mind. Assuming you're not realized, okay? Assuming that you are still 
a putu jana, that we're all putu janas. So you're not realized. If we are not realized, you look at your own mind. When someone says something nasty, when someone does something bad, what is your first reaction? His fault. Because you assume he has control over his words and his action. It is his fault. And if you think about it, embedded in that idea there is there is someone there. And if you look at your, the world around you, the people around you, there is a part in us that kind of hold each and every individual responsible for his or her own action. They are all responsible. And so we all, we are all having this idea of a self. You can say until the cow comes home, again, I said this, no, your Buddha says non-self, non-self, no self, no self. But really, we still hold people responsible. We still say individuals are to be blamed. So the assumption, therefore, embedded, embedded there is the idea someone is responsible. Okay, now let's say, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you all think about this. Buddhists believe in rebirth, right? We all believe that there are other future births. Someone you know, it's really nasty piece of work. Ill treats the, the parents, ill treats their children, the children, ill treats everybody. He finds something to kick, he kicks. Then when this individual die, and oh, comes another birth, but then this individual is human, but completely incapacitated, has all kinds of health issues, maybe. Uh, and, and you now know this person. But this individual in this life, over time, became a really nice being, a really nice person. In your mind, right, you ask yourself this. If you can see lives, would you hold him responsible for the actions of a different time? And now he's in this life, therefore, uh, what to do? You're so evil, what? You deserve it. Do you do things like that? I don't know. Maybe there is part in us that will. You, you, you just look at your own mind. This is me telling you this idea of a self is very insidious. And you can break this only when certain things start to become very obvious. Otherwise, the idea that there is an individual, there is a self. You have control. Why didn't you control your mouth? You have control. Why didn't you control your action? You know, that's the idea. If you say that, oh, he's just an evil guy, um, and it is his fault, it somehow makes, a, it makes you feel good. Do you know what I'm saying? This is, this is how the, the regular mind works. So here, the, the idea of eternalism here is that the, you, there is something that keeps on going. And life after life, it keeps going. Having this, this willing or whatever you call it, just, he's, he, he, he carries and he keeps going as intact. It's an intact being. Separate from the aggregates, there's this intact being that keeps going. If you find this hard to understand, you wait till you get to the next page. The next page is even harder to understand. What you need to understand here is to go into the mind, look at your own experience, see how the mind lays blame. And how the mind praises. When you praise somebody, oh, this guy is so wonderful. He's such a wonderful fella. Same thing. He has control. He chooses to do the right thing. He's a wonderful fella. He's eternally rewarded. The, the, the idea is, it, 
it's 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 like um it's almost like we can't quite the mind can't quite wrap itself around conditional changes conditional because the buddhist one is conditional arising this this implies you make a decision there are consequences you bear with the you live with the consequences because you were the one at fault you get it okay i try i try so now we come to the next one okay next one this one says but kasapa if one thinks so you see the word that he used the buddha used huh? thinks you don't know you think it through if one thinks the one who acts is one the one who experiences the result is another then one says asserts huh? when someone is stricken by feeling meaning someone is suffering one says suffering is created by another when you asserts this it amounts to annihilationism sometimes it's said annihilism sometimes it's annihilationism i just want to make this point clear annihilationism is not another this philosophy is also a key point a key selling point of the materialist philosophers okay what does it mean the materialists are the ones whom i now lovingly call the worm theory meaning they see the body and they see a self as one okay there is still a self but when the when the form dies the self dies this is annihilationism so then the question is why is it then it, it looks like this you see there is a decoupling right the actor and the victim they are not linked see that the one who acts and the one who experiences is another so there is a decoupling here which implies that this school in fact all of them they insist there is no such thing as karma i e people are not responsible for their action okay people are not responsible there's there is no such thing as karma you can do whatever you want remember all this uh, of the six major schools Jainism, Jainism. I think three of them, three of them are along this line, meaning to say there's no such thing as karma, that that uh, there are no effects. You can do whatever you want. You can kill something. You're just poking a knife into elements. Nothing is happening. So why is this nihilism? Because you, the idea here is you have no control. At every point you suffer, you suffer. It's too bad. There's no. There's, there is not. There is. There is no action reaction. There is no control. There is nothing. Annihilation. There's nothing. Die already all over. The idea is like that. Okay. So, Kasapa, because he was a naked ascetic, he would have been checking out the two schools and others these are the two main school there is a third school remember the part where he say neither by yourself nor another or both by sorry by uh the suffering is caused by myself and another this particular neither here nor there philosophy are the skeptics the ones who i cannot say this and i cannot say that it could be this it could be that i don't know which is which doesn't matter so they are the ones who, without a proper stand as far as i know uh, I'm not I'm not an expert on this this field. What you need to know is Kasapa was checking out the different schools and now he came to the Buddha. He wanted to know what was the Buddha's position, okay?
Wait, huh? Without veering towards either of the extremes, the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma by the middle. With ignorance as condition, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as conditions, as condition, consciousness comes to be. And we know the rest of the dependent origination, the, the 12th DO. Such is the origin of the whole mess of suffering. Such is the origin of the whole mess of suffering. So therefore, suffering is because of condition. Okay? Why is he, the Buddha said for for Kasapa's benefit and also for many of the individual who were in the Shramana community, when they come to him and they start raising these issues about eternalism and nihilism, Buddha will always maintain his practice as the middle path. Why the middle path? Oh, not yet. Sorry. Yeah. The middle path because there is continuity. Right? There is no end. There is rebirth. His teaching contains the notion of rebirth. Because when an individual dies and his craving is intact, the craving will trigger another birth. In that sense, it is not a nihilism. But he talks about the individual having partial control. Partial. It's not entirely no control. He is not entirely not responsible. But at the same time, he is not fully in charge. He is not fully responsible. He has some he has some role. He can make choices, real choices. But the moment he made his choice, it will live in print that will set the tone for the next event. Just think of it as, ah, I, I just thought of this wonderful uh, analogy. You know, there are some soup, I think. This, uh, I know, you know the law bar, is it the, the law, all right, the law bar. Luya, uh, Luya, the the stew, and the my my understanding I uh, could be really up, complete off here, but my understanding is when they make these stews, they actually don't throw away the sauces, they they basically just add on and add on and or whatever. There, there's some cuisine where you actually don't throw away the original sauces. And over time, you actually keep adding, adding until the, the condiments become very rich with flavor. You think about it. Think of the first pot, the very first pot that was boiled. And now, thousands of pot later. Is this the same pot? Or is it a different pot? You see what I'm saying? But along the way, you have choices to add things, right? There is a choice on what to add. And the choices on what to add will shape, will shape what's going on in this pot. Right? You see what I'm saying? The idea is something like that. The, 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 there is this constant flux of change. It keeps changing. And over time, shades have sh shifted. And, and you may well be that nothing of the of a, an earlier version is left, but the shades are still ch changing. Okay. Now, if you go by dependent origination, the critical point here, because Kasapa wanted to know what cause, what is the cause for suffering, and he looked to an individual. 
or some, someone? And the Buddha said, no. Suffering arises out of ignorance, a mental condition. As long as this mental condition exists, suffering is inevitable. That's the Buddha's point. It's a mental condition, a mental, whether there is understanding or no understanding, when you have no understanding, you are in for a lot of pain. Now, let's not go into the Arahan wisdom. Let's just take the mundane level wisdom. Ourself. Take ourselves because it's easier to understand when you are coming from this at this level. You know where you are, your understanding today. Today. You know where your understanding is, what it is, how much you know, how far you have come. You know that, right? There was a time when you knew so much less. Would you say that those days were much harder? That you, in those days, before you knew the Dhamma to this degree of understanding, would you say that those earlier days where you were more ignorant of the Dhamma, you actually felt Dukkha way more intensely. Would you say that? If you say that, then this point, you understand intuitively already, isn't it? That as you begin to understand the Dhamma, you actually knew how how to, what choices to make such that the dukkha reduces. Agree? That's what it means. This sentence is actually what it means. With growing understanding, you make wiser choices. Conscious, deliberate intervention to end dukkha is possible. Within limits means you still have your anusaya, you still have your impulses and habits and instincts, your compulsions. So you have to, it depends on how strong the compulsion is. You understand what causes pain, you choose wisely. But if your compulsion is stronger, then your determination to do good, then for that moment, you will suffer. If your compulsion is not strong enough to overcome your determination, then Liao, that moment you will pick wisely and it will then pave, pave the way for you to experience no dukkha. It's just like that. So, are you responsible? Yes, because you make choices. Are you truly, truly responsible and nothing else? Cannot be so unfair because there are compulsions, powerful forces, very strong instinct nudging you, pushing you. And because you were being push in that way, who are we to judge? Who are we to judge anyone when you are not there experiencing the compulsion? Then how does wisdom come into play? Wisdom leads one to say to himself, I must try. I must fight the compulsion. I must negate this compulsion. I must nullify it. I must, I must change it. So he then have to take the steps to shift, shift the habits. And only he can do it. Only he has the chance to do it. So with wisdom, sorry, with understanding, with effort, he makes the right choices which then leads to an outcome that gives him some assurance, gives him, delights him, and 
inspires him, encourages him, and then he pushes more in the right direction. Because every time he chooses wisely, he will feel joy. And that joy will keep him going in the right direction. That's how it works. Okay? It's not finished yet. Oh, it's almost finished. Uh, okay. Kasapa, as I said earlier, was actually very wise. Here, the Buddha explained about the nature of the mind. Dependent origination was actually talking about how the lack of wisdom and the wrong choices will lead to a life of dukkha. That's just the idea. And just say that, just that he got it. He understood. Enough for him to, okay, right, can I sign up for membership? So the ma has been made clear in many ways. As though, and this is my favorite stock phrase, this is my favorite one, as though he were turning upright what had been turned upside down. This phrase, because it appears everywhere so often, ever so often, we might pay it scant attention. But the beauty of this phrase is actually in the imagery. Something that is turned upside down cannot retain. A container turned upside down cannot retain anything. Everything would just flow off. So, uh, there was a point in his life, basically he's saying there was a point in his life where he will not gain in wisdom. He cannot grow spiritually. He, he is lost. You turn it upright means all feels right. Now I can grow. Now I, can, I know what to do. The idea here is now I feel right again. I can grow. Revealing what was hidden. If you think about this, right? Have you all spent time looking for something that was that you really want to find, but you couldn't find it? It was hidden. It can be very frustrating. So this guy is expressing, was expressing his joy in finally, finally, he's getting something that was very precious. Showing the way to one who was lost. The same, the idea here is you, you are desperate. You're very anxious. You're lost. You're looking for something you couldn't find. Things have been turned upside down. The, the idea here is you're helpless. You are lost. You, you don't know what to do. And he was settling it for him. He was doing it right. And the best, the best one is the last one, holding up a lamb in the dark for those with sight. With sight, very important. Meaning, those with the capacity to understand and see for themselves, the Dhamma likes the way. So it's very beautiful imagery. So he go, he, and because of that, so this front part of what it is like, this part, is the basis for this man to say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Today, for many of us, we may not be doing any of this and happily we are going for refuge. So you can see that our idea of refuge is perhaps not quite what is expected of us we need to have understanding, some understanding of the Dhamma. Then you will feel that, yes, the answer to my problem, the answer to my aggra aggravation and agitation and my loss, my, my feeling lost, can be found in the teaching of the Buddha. You must have some understanding. Then this statement, I go for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha becomes meaningful and impactful. Then, Kasapa asks for ordination. 
And the Buddha said to him, someone belonging to another sect needs to go on probation for four months. This is definitely a later part of the Buddha's sasana uh, dispensation. If you recall, in some of the suttas that we had covered earlier, people wanted to go for ordination, they just go. But not this one. This one needs to do probation. And Kasapa was like, oh, don't worry. As long as you give it to me, four years or so, I can do it. I can, I can take probation. And he, he looked at the Buddha, he said, if the bhikkhus are satisfied, they may give him the ordination. Meaning to say, now ordination is systematic. There are admission criteria. The other bhikkhus are going to judge. They are going to assess. And then they decide, yes or no, you meet the criteria. Presumably, presumably it meant that the order must now have been really large, really big. So there was a need to ensure that whoever joins the order, people are comfortable with them. Because they're going to share resources. Joining order means sharing resources. Huh? Share a place to sleep, share food to eat, share a place to squat, share a place to sit and listen to Dharma talk, share the teacher's time. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of sharing going on. You don't like the guy, you cannot have him in the order. Okay. And the final slide, oh, actually, second last slide. Naked ascetic, eventually he received a higher ordination. Not long after that, look at this, huh? not long after that, which means more than four months. Remember the four months probation? After four months plus something, something, a few more, a, sh a short time. While dwelling alone, Withdrawn, diligent, ardent, resolute, realize for himself with direct knowledge. In this very life, enter and dwell in the unsurpassed goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen go into homelessness. So he realized for himself, Nibbana. Hmm? Directly knew, directly knew, so he's, he had seen for himself in his mind, something happened, he saw it, and he knew, okay, that's it. Destroy is birth, meaning when he dies in that state, in that life, that's it. Destroy his birth. He had finished his job. Holy life has been lived. What had to be done has to be done. In other words, if you think about this sentence, right? The, the reason why I flashed this out is because I think there's something worth dissecting in this sentence. Nibbana means there is a destruction of craving because it is craving that leads to rebirth. So one who is an Arahan would have completely destroyed, pulled out, eradicated, vanished, vanished craving. Hence, no more birth. Okay? One, two. What had to be done, has been done, means there are... There are Oh, sorry, holy life has been lived means in the manner that he conducted himself in life, it would have been completely consistent with the teaching. His mind, his life was pure. Okay? What had to, had to be done has been done means there are some things that had to be fixed in the mind. We have conditions arising, anusaya, your stain, your taints, and all those things. All those taints had to evaporate. They have to be gone. So he practiced the path in such a way that the taints 
could disappear, could, could clean up. And so there is no more state of being. Okay? Okay. This is, this is the last slide. And there are some points here worth exploring further. I said that Buddha's premise for Dukkha, two drivers, ignorance and craving. Why ignorance and craving? Because if you look at dependent origination, dependent origination starts with ignorance. Ignor this dependent origination is not a thinking, it is not a thought process. It is wrong to think it's a thought process. It's not, okay? It is Buddha explaining how ignorance, how ignorance can become, because ignorance is, it's a, Ignorance is lack of knowledge. I'm, tr I'm trying to explain it. Uh, you all bear with me a bit. Huh? Ignorance is knowledge. Lack, no knowledge. How does no knowledge affect the mind in such a way that you have dukkha? That's, that's the point. How does one who lack this knowledge, the noble truths, ignorance of the noble truths. How does lacking knowledge of noble truth lead to dukkha? Dukkha is sensation, feeling. One is knowledge, ideas, brain, baseline, you know? How does that lead to pain. So he wanted, he, he had to figure out where the connecting point is. So from ignorance, it's because of ignorance as a driver, we, our habit will swing. With ignorance as a condition, there is Shankara. So ignorance as your baseline, you will have your, your habits, your, your, you are driven, your, your inside here, the baselines, the ambience starts from the ignorant, ignorant position. So the choices that you make, the way you see things, the way you react to things, the, 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 the very instinctive reaction, it's all based on that ignorance. It sits on that ignorance. And that kind of expressions, volitional formation, that kind of Shankara creates the ambience in the mind, consciousness. That becomes your world. Within this consciousness sits Namarupa. Do you understand? Consciousness, within that consciousness sits Nama Rupa. Within Nama Rupa sits six sense bases. Within six sense bases presents the, the condition for contact. Without six sense bases, no contact. It's actually all within, all within. It's your aggregates. That's why I always said, actually, this is about your aggregates. How ignorance shape the aggregates such that there is dukkha. He teased it out. It's the Four Noble Truth teased into dependent origination. So, okay, consciousness, within that consciousness sits this Nama Rupa, and Nama Rupa, within the Nama Rupa sits the six sense spaces. It springs from that. Okay? And because there is Nama Rupa, sorry, because there are six sense bases, there is contact. 
is that contact. But contact actually is embedded there. Because if you look at Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa itself has contact. It's all embedded in there. Right? And Nama Rupa in itself has Sanya. It's all embedded there. So he was actually just teasing it out for you, teasing different parts to show you that actually it's all embedded there. Okay. Now, why then do I say the premise for Dukkha is ignorance and craving? So because of ignorance, your Sankara, Kisi, all right, cha 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 your Vinyana is all, all embedded there. Your, your five aggregates sits on ignorance. And it's the five aggregates of grasping. It's because of ignorance you crave and you grasp. And it's the craving and grasping that leads to Dukkha. That's the condition for Dukkha. If you have no ignorance, there will be no craving, no, no grasping. If your ignorance is completely eradicated, that's why I said, when there is Vija of the noble truth, absolute Vija, craving is no more. The moment there is no more uh, vidya, craving is over. Okay? So, there is no self, but there is perpetual becoming because of craving. You think of, think of this as an energy that keeps going on. To think of something as a self is to identify with it and to own it, and that idea in itself, the idea in itself creates craving and attachment. Just the idea. And it's, a, it's, it's this, it's this a circle, cycle. Attachment creates the being. With the idea of the being creates more attachment. It, it, it kind of reinforce each other, okay? There's no self, yet there's a perpetual becoming because of the craving. So I want to use the word tangha, which was the Buddha's word, craving, greed. With, the idea is wanting, wanting, craving. Eh? We'll keep rebirth going until there is complete vijja, complete vijja, complete understanding of the noble truths. Okay, this part here, there are four things. We, we, when we talk about the Four Noble Truths, it is important to understand the Four Noble Truths properly. The Buddha calls it, there is Dukkha. The, the very nature of life, the way that the life is inevitably there will be dukkha. Just, just the, na the natural progression of life, meaning born, grow old, fall sick, die. Just a natural progression of life. It's supreme painful. Death is a permanent cut from, from a relationship, in a relationship. And the more people you know, the more cuttings there will be. It's like death by a thousand knives, you know. You know 1,000 people with a thousand knives. And there will always be things that you like, things that you don't like. And then, therefore, you will struggle with emotional pain in a big way. And then, the very nature of the mind thinking. When the mind starts thinking, the mind thinks of what it likes and how to avoid what it doesn't like. That's a mind's habit. The very habit itself creates problem. So this has to be understood properly. And then the second one says, the origin of Dukkha, which is craving. Uh -huh. That craving has to be abandoned. So once you understand craving, once you understand the correlation, the trick is not to understand craving. The trick is to be able to let go, 
to abandon, to slice it off, let it go. No more, no, no more digging, no more wanting. So you see, understanding the Four Noble Truths is not difficult. Effectively cultivating the mind to the point where it completely lives the Four Noble Truths, that's difficult. Because it's not just understanding First Noble Truth, but abandoning, craving. Because when you abandon craving, then it is possible to experience cessation of dukkha. Experiencing cessation of dukkha has to be done again and again and again and again until the mind gets it. Craving is dukkha. So that it will learn not to hold. And then the fourth one is cultivating a way of life changing, which completely rewire the way the mind works, rewire the way, the way that we behave, rewire it completely. That's the objective of the Eightfold Path. Change the way you think, change the way you talk, change the way you act, change the way you look at the world, and so on and so forth. Change you. Because it says, the fourth noble truth has to be develop, cultivated. Again, uh, I stress, uh, it is not understanding four noble truths. You only understand the first one. The rest requires you to do things. You accomplish them correctly, understand the first noble truth, abandon the second one, realize the third one, cultivate the fourth one, you do them for perfect, that's when you really, really begin to experience properly. The, the knowledge starts to blossom in the mind. The knowledge of the noble truth starts to blossom in the mind. Okay? The third point, where there is tangha, there is kamma. Now you know why the Arahans do not create Kamma. Because they have no Tangha. Any Tangha will leave a stain in the mind. Any drop of it will leave a stain. The Arahans have no preferences, no desire. So it doesn't leave stains. Okay? I said here, and now this is a very famous set of nouns. To which the Buddhas use to describe our relationship with Kama. Kama are actions that we consciously take, decisions that we consciously make. So he, in that stanza, he talks about us being the owner of Kama, the heir to Kama, born of Kama, um, born, B O R N. Born of Kama, fettered to the Kama, and Kama is a refuge. That's the, that's the full stanza. But I'm only using two here, just as illustration. Owner and heir, sounds like two, two separate things. Owner because you do have choices. You can choose to do, you can choose to restrain. You can choose to act or you can choose to restrain. You could choose to pay attention or you can choose to ignore. You have choices. They are not fake, they are real. Very often, we think we don't have choices because we have subconsciously erased some of the things because of the way we think and the way we talk. We subconsciously say, this one cannot, this one cannot, this one cannot, only this one left. Then you yourself were to tie yourself into a knot and deny yourself of choices. But the reality is you have choices, real choices. But once you make choices, once you make choices, they will leave their imprints in your memory bank, in your consciousness. Your, you, will, you will change as these choices pile up. Every steps that you make leave footprints. 
some footprints are very hard to erase because your mind keeps revisiting them. Some footprints are barely imprint, so, so slight that one day later forgotten. Now, you know for yourself, if let's just say looking at today, I ask you, what do you remember of today? There will be the ones that you remember, but the most things you've forgotten. So the ones that you have forgotten, they don't leave much of an imprint. Now, there will be the habits that comes out again and again. And the habits will therefore leave bigger footprints. Every day you do something, one day you don't do, you feel rather odd. So those habits leave heavy footprints. Okay? And the heavier they weigh on your conscience, the deeper they cut. Buddha's point was, you think about it, your actions, why you made those actions. Very often, the action sits on craving. Very often, they sit on craving. In fact, most time they sit, all time they sit on craving. Think about it. Okay. The question is, you, you start to weigh the options, which one maximizes pain and minimize, sorry, minimizes pain and maximizes benefit. I choose that one. Then if 50 50 long jump puff, and then you figure cross, hope for the best, right? All the time we are doing that. So when we are doing that, we are actually tanghaing away. We are tanghaing away. Okay, by the choices that we make, we create conditions for happiness or suffering. Sukha or dukkha, however transient. This is not the ultimate thing, you know. This is, this is not the ultimate dukkha and the ultimate sukha. This is we constantly create condition day by day, day by day for your own state of mind state of well-being okay the final point can you now see that there is dukkha but there is no dukkha <laughs> sufferer <laughs> because in buddhism we are talking about a momentum that keeps going the momentum is driven largely by craving and ignorance okay and that is the final slide so we should go into the questions everyone can see the question right okay so you all look at question one q1 why is it not seeing suffering first then followed by truly knowing suffering Knowledge, jnana dasana. It's actually knowledge of suffering, then seeing it. You see, uh, at a moment of insight, when something dawns on you, right? Usually it's a recognition. Recognition means you remember something that the Buddha taught, and then you you recall what he taught, then you recognize it, right? The part where you recall what he taught, what is that? This knowledge. You know what I'm saying? So you recall, we are not so smart. We, we, are, we don't have what it takes to spot something that he hasn't taught. This is talking about the ultimate reality. In the ultimate reality, not mundane reality, not conventional reality, ultimate reality, the nature of the mind as is. That part, to, to, to realize what, to correlate what he had taught with what you are seeing, there has to be that recollection first. Oh, I know this. This is that. So the part where you remember... That part is the knowledge. The part where you correlate and recognize that's, that requires the seeing. 
that when the two has come together, that is why there is a third part after after knowing things for what they are, nyana dasana, then comes capacity for the mind to start to turn away from craving. In fact, there is actually another sutta. Uh, I won't go into that, but there is another sutta which actually gives even more elaboration on what happens to the mind when it when the dhamma starts to come alive. He, he, he broke it down to even more levels of understanding. So this is just first level of understanding. Okay. Okay, next question. Q2. Does one know does one's own karma plays a part in experiencing happiness and suffering? Uh, does one yes I think yes yes let me explain how it, this this thing. first I must stress uh, definition of karma is about the choices that one makes the deliberate choices which leads to the living the leaving of footprints or imprints in the mind Okay, we are not talking about boomerangs from the past. I keep stressing that. Meaning we parker the fruit of the actions from a different time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about now. Day by day, the choices that we make shaping our life, our happiness, our mental state for good or for bad. And I'm answering this question from this angle, okay? If we have been shaping our mind in such a way that we build up a store of cortisol and adrenaline, angry energy, agitating en uh, chemicals in the mind, then you tell me, a mind that is so stressed, can he feel happy? Short-lived, maybe can laugh at a joke. Some, some a show that he's watching, he ha 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 ha. Then after the show is over, he will remember the agitation because the chemicals are there. His mental state is in a bit of a semi-boil. So he, the agitation is inbuilt. You can actually build your mind into a state of semi buisson or totally buisson meaning you are completely unhappy you are so fed up you really cannot take it and half the time you have that resentful energy when you have that kind of a resentful energy you think about it everything that you see will be through the resentful lens right everything that you see always done the work on me, always claim my credit, da, 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 da. your mind is really talking like that. It's very hard to break away from that lens. In that sense, you can, you can corner yourself into an unpleasant mental state. And if you don't do the necessary to find your way out, you can be stuck there causing a lot of stresses on the form. So what is in the mind starts to take a, a toll on the form and eventually creates all kinds of uh, physical problems from high blood pressure to diabetes to, I don't know, obesity. Everything blame, like, never mind, blame, blame on mental states, cancer. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have, I, I'm not a doctor. But I do know that minimally, when you get upset, your blood pressure goes up. That one we know. Well documented. And a, a, a blood pressure that is constantly on the high will eventually lead to problems. Now, let's take the other example. Let's not get morbid. Let's take other nice ones. A mind that focuses on uh, loving kindness, on giving, on faith, on caring, 
all this positive mental energy, you will find that eventually you, you keep doing this. Initially, it may be hard because it's a little bit out of the, the character for you. But if you keep doing it, at some point, it becomes easier and easier, becomes more and more second nature. When you find that it's actually quite easy for you to be generous, to be giving, to, to love, to say all the nice things, when you find that it's very easy to do these things, you know your mind is rewiring already. It's starting to change. And then you look at your own, your own uh, mental state. You will find that the, the joy become easier, more spontaneous. You, you may, because your, because your mental state is positive, then whatever things that you see, you hear, that comes through in through your filter, they all comes through a nice filter. A filter that tells you, the world is nice. You, because you will be focusing on all the nice parts. Instead of in the past, you could be focusing on all the not so nice part. Depending on what you focus, actually, this is your own clue to yourself. Just just for yourself, right? You don't have to tell us. I'm not taking a survey. You're not in a classroom setting. In a classroom setting, I'll take a survey. But here on Zoom, you look at look at your own mind and you ask yourself this. You hear someone say something about doing dana or doing something wonderful and achieving something wonderful. You forget how your mind talks. If your mind says, lucky fella, such a lovely lady, da, 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 everything very nice, da, 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 chipping away, right? Then it says that you are on the shade of the bright colors, meaning you're nicer person. You are nice, nice person. Wholesome. Ho more wholesome. But if the words that come up in you, in here, are... Sure or not, got bluff or not. I tell you, I think this kind of people always boast. Uh, da, 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 da. So your the kind of words that come out of your mouth, sorry, come out of your mind are all the negative words, all the negative words. Then you know for yourself you are shading towards darker colors. You know for yourself. And as you begin to understand the Dhamma, you should be shading towards the lighter color, not staying in the darker color, colors. Okay, this is, this is the Sylvia Big color coordination, color ranges approach to knowing where, where you are gearing towards. Are you gearing towards the dark or you are, you are drifting towards the light? And you will know for yourself. No one knows this better than you. But you have to be very honest with yourself. Don't everything, yeah, correct, I'm such a lovely person. <laughs> No one agrees with you. <laughs> Maybe we should do a 360 for everybody uh, on the Dhamma field. So, oh, I think I've like strayed all over. That's why I, under I have explained uh, question two, right? Question three, are we not inheritor of our own Dhamma? Yes, you are. The Dhamma is the, the mind. Your mind, your lenses, your processing machinery is your kama. If you think about it, what's processing here, it's how it keeps shifting and changing and shading, right? It, it keeps shifting. That, that's the res this is the result of kama. You're not looking at past lives, you know. You don't have to go so far back. This life, you're actively shifting, actively reshaping. You see what I'm saying? What has been done in a different time and leading to all kinds of experiences in this life, you just bear with it. Take it as they come. But don't lose wholesomeness in the process of dealing with them. Because if you lose wholesomeness, then you also lose happiness in this life. Whatever comes, you just take it. This is just another pit stop, if you like. It's a temporary. It's, we, we are all transient. We, all of us are transient. 10 years from now, some of us won't be here anymore. 20 years from now, even less number will be here. Only the tiny little ones will be here. 
we're all transient. Ah, but then we have a new fellow that comes along. Like that, lor. And it goes on. So we are inheritor of our karma. We are. Because every day, every moment, you are walking around with a recomputing computer. It keeps rebooting. As it goes day on day by day, it keeps rebooting. What you take away at the end of a day, right? After you've lived a day, you need to take stock. And at the end of this day, you ask yourself, what has changed? What has improved? What have you learned? How have you grown? And then today is worth it. Today has been a good day. I think you do it at night or you do it in the morning, it doesn't matter. Meditation is not just about entering jhana. It is also about reflection. This Saturday's talk has a portion on meditation. Big portion. In fact, the whole thing is on meditation. That one is a very fascinating sutta. I don't know why I'm advertising, but just share it with you. <laughs> okay, we move on. Huh? Question four. Second noble truth points out that the cause of suffering is our craving here in this sutta is due to ignorance, due to disorder. Uh, okay. You see, the dependent origination is, if you like, uh, think of it like an elaboration of the four noble truths. Okay. Buddha's Dhamma is not self-contained. They are all interrelated. They all lock into a universal whole. When he taught his disciples, he had to approach from different angles to help different people. When the Buddha opened shop, when he opened shop and started his business, this was Dhamma Jaka. Bawatana Sutta, right? The first one. When he opened shop, he chong, then he met these five fellows. He has so much hope for them. You must understand where he's coming from, okay? 35 years old, newly discovered a Dhamma. There is a part in him that you remember he had some reservation about sharing because he, he had already concluded. It's very hard for people to understand. I also don't know how to teach them. And then you had Brahma Saham Patik came and it is said that Saham Patik made a case for the Buddha to try because there will be people who understand. Please try. Remember? You don't remember, read my book, Between the Lines. Okay? Another advertisement for you. Okay. And he was convinced. He was moved essentially by compassion, okay? It wasn't wisdom. Buddha was moved essentially by compassion to say, okay, we will try and help those who could understand, understand. You may not realize the challenge for him. You think about it, huh? you, you, you put yourself in his shoes. Try, try. Try to put yourself in his shoes. He has achieved anything that he wanted to achieve. Cessation. Liberation of the mind. He got it. He understood. He's free as a luck. He can move off. Wandering around in the forest and, and enjoying his life. So, he is not going to use his family's fortune. He's not going to use anything from his family. He's going to satu orang. Eh? One person in ancient India is going to teach the Dhamma to a world that had never heard of his teaching. You think about what confronted him before you judge him and say, why Buddhas realize really never immediately go and of everybody, save all beings, sentient beings. You, you look at it practically from his perspective. Today, in the age of telecommuting, 
Zoom and, and everything, right? You've got media, you've got social media. And then we wonder, should we teach? Uh, will people understand? Do they really care? Why do we bother? You know what I'm saying? We, we, we see these things. 2,500 years ago, the odds were against him. And still, he decided, fine, he will try. So he had to think very carefully whom he's going to teach. Because, because he had to taste success. And you say Buddha must taste success. Buddha is also human. If he didn't taste success, then he had to think about how to approach the problem again, right? He has to go back to his drawing board and start again, which was what happened. He went, he had some other candidates that fell out of the, the story because they, they, they were not impressed. And then he, he looked his eyes on these five. They were his selected, huh? personally handpicked by the Buddha. And then they didn't understand, except for one. Right? Kondanya entered the stream. Only one got it. So the way to teach as Four Noble Truth couldn't work. That, was, that, was, that must have been his conclusion. There has to be other ways. So he came up with Anatta Lakana, which is the second point. Basically, the Four Noble Truth was actually what it is. The sum of it all. The Dhamma. Realization. That's there. It's all there. But we all don't understand. Because we're not very bright. We have a problem understanding Buddha. So because of that, he came up with Anatta Lakana. And in subsequent suttas, again and again, he will always do Anatta Lakana version. Because the Four Noble Truth version, people don't understand. They don't click. Click. Dependent origination is trickier. He taught dependent origination to monks. Because here they are, all of them working very hard, staring at the mind. So now he has to link, link the Four Noble Truth, which is embedded in this dependent origination. He has to link it from there for them to see. Okay? It's a linking process. So they are the same. You, basically, these guys are staring at their minds very hard. They will see the five aggregates of grasping. They will see that five aggregates very well. That is their job when they are practicing. When you can see that five aggregates, it is very clear to you, craving as the mental energy that runs right through them. It becomes very clear to them. But that doesn't mean they see cessation. You can see craving doesn't mean you can see cessation. Not in that state. Okay? So, they will still have to understand that everything is conditionally a reason until they can get it. They're not supposed to hold. They're supposed to let go. So, to let be. So, he will have other suitors to explain how they, the mind can turn away from a fixation with objects. The challenge is for the mind to turn away from being caught up with objects. And there will be other suttas where he taught them how to do it. So there are many suttas, as I said, teaching people to come and understand the mind in different ways. Fundamentally, they have to see anicca dukkha anna in the way that the mind, as they stare at the mind, they must recognize these features. They must understand that the individual comprises instinctively the parts that they can see for themselves, that five, that, that five aggregates. That's what they can see. That's what they can catch. And then they can see the craving that is embedded in all of them. Once he can guide them to let go of each one, each of the aggregates, they are done. But they have to let go. They must know how to let go. So all, this, all these are all in the teaching. Okay? All these are in the teaching. Okay. Um, question five, right? Can we say, although there is successive life, 
if there is still craving, the consciousness is changing constantly. The doer is not the same as one. No, you cannot say it like this. <laughs> Can you say da, 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 da. I tell you why. We all can't help but come from the angle of attachment. We don't realize that the driving force that sits in our heart, on our mind, that driving, that gripping energy is attachment. We are attached to life. We are attached to experiences. I, I repeat, uh, it starts as us being attached to experiences. Experiences is where we have pleasure. And from attachment to experiences comes attachment to living. Because only when there is life, there can be experience. Where there is no life, you imagine no more experience. So the first and foremost attachment is to experiences. That is why we said karma, tangha, experiences of sense delights, experiences, okay? And once you have the life, once there is this life, you cannot understand, you cannot imagine what is wrong with life. That resistance is avijja. That is ignorance. Do you understand me so far? These are the three key elements to holding us to life. Okay? And from these comes the idea that yes, we can see, we can see people live and die. We can see that. So we know that will happen to us. But we don't want that to happen. We can't bear the thought of losing people we love. So there is that attachment to people who, whose presence is a source of pleasure for us. So it goes back to pleasure. Okay? And because of this clinging, it is very comforting. Comforting to believe that people, being, consciousness, whatever that you call it, you want to believe it is the same as the previous one. You want to believe in continuity because continuity gives us comfort. It's reassuring. It tells us that death is not the end. Otherwise, it's very painful. How do you break this, this pain? is to begin to see that all experiences are no more than five aggregates. If you look at your entire world of experience, it's essentially the five aggregates. Everything you can imagine. When the aggregates come together, there is a person and an experience. You tease, you tear away the aggregates. There's nothing left. Okay? And if we learn to, again, as you must have faith. You must have faith and believe that if we keep doing it, we keep doing it, we keep telling ourselves, this feeling is not mine, not I, not self, this Perception is not mine, not I, not self. This, you keep doing that. 
at some point, you really will start to see that an experience is really parceled out. It's parceled out. You can see the different parts of an experience. The moment you start to develop a certain distance to these little aggregate, these little parts, it's, it will become bearable, much easier to bear. And as your understanding grow about the impermanent nature of arising conditions, then it's very easy to accept change. Now it's hard to imagine because you're trying to imagine within this context, within your current context, you are imagining the end game from your current context. You cannot do that. Faith means you believe he is right and you will employ the methods he gave you. And from the methods, you start doing it. And what's the method? Again, every feeling, perception, thinking, volitional affirmations, and so on, each one you keep saying, this is not mine, not I, not mine, not about I. There is no self in this. This is not self. This experience is not a self. You keep doing that, you have to tease out the, the aggregate, peel it, to Break the habit of seeing the aggregate as one. You peel it and split it. And when you split it, at some point, you will begin to accept that there is no living or no energy. As I said, whatever that you call it, the moment it triggers an attachment in you, then... Whatever you call it, it's going to cause a rebirth. It's going to spring out again. You can call it consciousness. You can call it energy. You can call it soul. You can call it self. You can call it essence. You can call it being. Whatever you call it, the end game is the same. You still want to believe that it's something that, trans that goes from point to point to point to point. And it's the same something. You can't see it as stream, flow of stream. It can be individualized stream, meaning this stream and that stream and that stream. But it's just a stream. Okay? Uh, six, it's hard to let go abandon craving. Is it to just let craving be and not act on it? Craving goes away. It's not about actively abandoning craving. Cause that in itself. Now, well, that's wisdom here. You are right. If you're trying to abandon craving, it is also craving. It is to accept things as they are. It's to accept. To not choose. You will see in yourself a sensation of preference. I want this. I want that. And you just say it's okay. It's okay. Anything is okay. So you train your mind to not choose. You see how the mind chooses. At every little step, the mind chooses. The Buddha, when he accepts a lunch invitation, have you noticed the word that says, the Buddha consented in silence. Have you all noticed that expression? Buddha gave his consent he, in silence. He said nothing and they know that it means okay. This is not choosing. If, if the, the time has been taken by someone else, he will say, this time has been taken by someone else. If the slot is free, he will just... Oh, there you know already. Okay. Buddha said, okay, happy you go home and prepare. 
the the mind stops choosing it is free and easy it has no preferences that's what it means now then why did he say abandon craving right bahana the word is bahana it's really to abandon it actually means this you see sometimes we can let things be and then something fades from the from the mind but the chances are you will go back and revisit it let's say you get angry with someone right you got angry anger arises anger fades but no we have to revisit the idea so when you revisit a thought anger arises again when we say abandon craving there is a part in us that just accept whatever and then we say it's okay i have no views anymore let be so if you are serious and you are sincere and your practice is good you're constant telling you're constantly telling yourself no preference it's okay i let be right that constant creating a new habit will then become your your baseline increasingly you have no strong views it becomes a new baseline for you initially when you start doing this you will find that you have a lot of views in fact if you are one with few views it actually means you're quite easy going but if someone has many views with gradations in different subsections which in our common lingo goes he is very meow super cat very meow then what you're saying is this individual is full of dukkha a lot of craving and therefore much much dukkha we when you have very strong views over many things you can be sure the person creates a lot of stress for himself and creates a lot of stress for other people if the individual has fewer views very few views very selective in where he places his effort and emphasis he has much less dukkha and you associating with him also feel less stress it is just like that so the this whole this whole thing it is not as easy as we happily say it is but you know it from your association with people that there are the people who are very particular and are the ones who have very who is far more easy going and just see for yourself which one has stronger craving that's where you know then you go back to go, go back to yourself if you have very strong strong preferences if you have very strong preferences you must teach yourself to say i will trim the number of things that i talk about i complain about i whine about i will trim the number of things i will shorten the list i will reduce the intensity and as you go along reducing the intensity and shortening the list you are walking this path okay can you please explain again that suffering there's no sufferer suffering is a sensation sufferer is an idea when you have an ex when you have an experience it is suffering but the but to say that in that suffering is a person is a being is an essence something ex you you basically have imbued an experience with an identity an individual they say yeah but but the person is there the person is there yes but if the person perceives himself to be suffering he suffers more if the person sees that this is an activity that goes on without being engaged with the activity then the activity will fade away and he's fine but one who suffers will then one who perceives himself as an individual will then tell the story of how he had suffered 
And therefore, he made everybody suffer a lot as he recounts his story. So, if we can actually see that it, there is suffering and not no sufferer, instead of uh, being fixated about the sufferer, any fixation with the sufferer will end up with a lot of people suffering. It's a joke. <laughs> okay, um, Q8. Do you have the reference, the reference for the sutta you highlighted? Which one? On the mind of the uh, person who is uh, going towards um, awakening. Oh, you want the, the details? Uh, you know, when we process this, this sutta, this uh, talk, we will put in the reference. Does, okay, does boasting one's donation and dana loses your, your merit? It is not like that. The, there is no credit debiting going on per se, okay? It's not so straightforward. If an individual is one who talks constantly about how much he had dana and how much he had given, then the individual has much clinging, much clinging to his identity. From that angle, from that angle, the individual has dukkha because he's clinging. Okay? And it is not like I give $10, then I talk, 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 talk about how much I've given, then it, the, the $10 credit becomes $5. It is not like that. It doesn't work like that. You may devalue a gift if your mind, while it was wholesomeness that led you to give the gift, but it's unwholesomeness when you regret giving. So it will cancel the, the joy in the mind. Okay? When you give, there is joy. But when you regret, that sense of joy diminished. So in that sense, even though you had given, it's as if you had not. Okay? That is why Buddha always talked about the purity of the giver and the purity of the receiver. The one who gives must give with joy, with wholesome mental states, particularly in faith, meaning you don't give and you suspect, you give and you trust. You, you give because you hope that the individual, the person who is receiving, can do good out of it, can help him or her, can lift people out of the difficulties they were in. So you keep the mind wholesome cheering others on, something like that. The diminishing will come with more what kind of mental states post the gift. But it's all in the mind. So if you, if you give and you regret, then it's like your joy has dissipated. Joy has dissipated, wasted effort. If you give, and then you want to talk so much about it. And others who got tired listening to you show you face, your joy will also dissipate. Also not so good. And maybe it will end up with people saying, oh, this individual is full of boasting. So it damaged your reputation. In this life, we're not talking about next life. In this life, you go around and you boast a lot, then it damages your reputation. Okay. Would it be correct to say that the greatest attachment is to the sense of self? I don't understand. Greatest attachment is to this sense of self? Sorry, I, 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 I don't understand. This is not a great... Uh, there is no greatest of attachment. All attachments, not good attachment. Because attachment means dukkha. Where there is attachment, there is dukkha. That's all. It's not good or bad. We, if we don't want 
dukkha. We don't. We we hope not to be experiencing dukkha. Then it is not managing outside. Change people, change environment, change the condition. It's not outside. It's all inside. You want happiness. The way that the mind works is to have happiness. You must give. The giving, for strange reason, giving brings up happiness. In fact, if you go online and you do a Google search on the psychological reports, scientists have actually done studies on what happens to the mind when it gives. When the mind, when people give, right? They have found that when the giving itself creates certain chemicals, feel-good chemicals. So the joy that one feels when one is giving, it's real. It actually creates a chemical. And, and all these, it's just nature. It's just nature. Uh -huh. Okay. I, uh, at the death, I'm looking at question 11. Uh, at the deathbed, someone might experience weakness of mind due to declining mental condition. He may have fear of impending death. How can I help him to avoid his mind sliding into eternalism? Uh, Clinging on to life is natural. It's a natural thing. And Buddha, if you look at the suttas, you will find that, um, not Buddha, but Sariputta, for instance, there was this individual who was a Brahmana, and therefore he was very attached to the Brahman, Brahma realm. And Sariputta helped him to make his way to the Brahma realm. That was a mistake. Because Buddha then reprimanded him for doing that. But nonetheless, what that episode tells you is that the monks do not teach people. It's not about sliding into eternalism. This eternalism is a whole, whole, whole idea. What you want to do is to help people feel joy. You don't cling on to this life because clinging on to this life gives pain. What you want is to help them let go of this life and recalling their own wholesome mental state so that the mind will transit into a wholesome birth. Rebirth. Do you understand? This part is very important. It's not clinging on to life as such. This, this is not eternalism. It is actually don't cling on to this, this life. Don't cling on to your relatives, your friends, your money, your possession. Don't, don't hold on to any of this. But instead, recall all the goodness, all the happiness, all the giving. The, 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 the state of uh, all the hand, wholesome state you can think of. And usually it is about how they had been good parents and they have been loving people and they have brought up family into uh, uh, good members of society that they have finished their, this life. Now it's time to move on. And you move on recalling your faith. So whatever, whatever faith that they have, recall the faith to lift the mental energy, the mental state. So that when they take on another birth, another becoming, it will be a wholesome one. You want them not to be afraid. You have to guide them. Guide them by saying, there is nothing to be afraid. You have been a good person all your life. You want that joy to come up. If that joy comes up, they are fine. Okay? If that joy, that they had lived a good life, that it is time to move on, 
It's okay. 我坐前前锋 ，I go first. It's okay. Just go. Because this individual hasn't arrived at knowing how to let go of craving. Allowing craving. Someone asked this question earlier. One thing to drop craving is one thing, isn't it? Yes. So it is not. I don't want craving. It is I accept. But if your entire life, this individual had never practiced acceptance, contentment, no strong views, easy going. If the person has not practiced that, last minute you want him to. It's impossible. It's going to be very hard. So you want to remind the individual of the goodness of his of his life to make him to help him recall his joy. That's point one, huh? That's point one. The second more important part for those of you who are of age, or you have family members whom you are concerned about. You want to help now. Now is the time to help. Not wait until deathbed. Now is the time when you help your loved ones understand the importance of wholesome mental state as a matter of daily life, so that at the end, that mental state comes up spontaneously. The best, the best is this individual. In his entire life, had been very easygoing and a happy person. Then at the end, it is just for him. It's like a slide into a familiar habit. Whereas if you have someone who is fairly old but still very strong in dosa, very strong in loba. You have your work cut out for you, because you have to teach this individual, you have to help this individual, become more giving, more sharing, more loving. Don't reprimand. You spend your life telling this person why your words so bad, why you so nasty. If you don't show the person love, the person don't know how to show love. You must be able to show the fellow love. Get the fellow into a good mood. Get your parents into a good mood. Feel good. Then they naturally love. Then it's your skill. How often can you help them do that? How often can can you help your parents stay happy, so that they will continue to be happy and use sweet words, kind words, wholesome words for others. So don't sit there and pontificate. Help them. Okay. Yes. Question eleven is the last question. I I wanted everyone to just look at the words here. This is very important because if regularly, if regularly you reflect on this, it will also help you at the end, especially that last stanza, that last uh, para. So let me just repeat, read this. If you had experienced joy listening to the Dhamma, do consider honoring our teacher by putting into practice his first teaching to the lay community. Be chaga, donate, help, give support of time and energy to a worthy charity and spiritual organization of your choice. This part is very important. If this has not been something you have been doing in your daily life, in small ways or in big ways, do consider starting soon, because you really don't know when time will run out. Okay, this part is very important. We must never take for granted the blessing that we have enjoyed in this life. As our forerunners had done it right by us, we must continue the good work for those who come. After honestly, we have to keep replenishing merits because, like all petrol, it will run out, and then you don't want the dirt to come gushing out at you. May the dama last long. 
may we never, may we continue to support, to enjoy supportive condition for learning and practice. And may we never deviate from the true teaching as long as life lasts. I'll be sharing merits and doing the chanting at the end. Dedication of merits. Let us dedicate the merits from participating in this wholesome Dhamma activity to our departed relatives and friends. Idamme nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Idamme nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Idamme nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Closing chant. Mano pum bangam madam ma mano seta mano maya manasa che padutena basati wa karoti wa tato nang du kang mang weti. Ichakang wao wahato padang Mano pumbang gamma damma Mano seta mano maya Manasa che pasanena Abasati wa karoti wa Tato nang su Kang mang weti ichaya wa anapai ni tato nang su kang mang weti ichaya wa anapai ni tato nang su kang mang weti ichaya wa Anapaini Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu